You forgot your red and green tally cards, the original set. You can get a blank set from the check-in tables. You must write your name and precinct number on each card. Tally vote cards without names will not be counted. Tonight, you received a new set of cards numbered 7 to 12. You must bring all tally cards, both sets of cards, to every town meeting from this point forward. Seating on the floor of the auditorium must be occupied only by town meeting members except for the front row which may be used by members of the press and by members of town committees and town staff participating in presentations. Such persons must wear non-voter stickers which are available at the check-in table. Seats in front of me to the right are occupied by the select board, the town manager, the finance director, the assistant to the town manager, and an IT staff person. The finance committee is seated to my left. Spectators and town residents who are not town meeting members may be seated in the bleachers to the rear of the auditorium. New information for town meeting members can be found on the back table to my left, back over there. Old information can be found on the back table to my right. Amherst Media provides gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of our proceedings on public access channel 17, but not tonight. Apparently there are problems and there is not a live feed going out. There will be tens of thousands of disappointed viewers out there. <laughs> but the problem has nothing to do with the staff and volunteers who are here, so I would still like to thank them for their service. If you wish to speak, you must raise a hand and be recognized. When appropriate, please hold up a green or red card indicating pro or con on an issue. When you're called on, please first state your name and precinct. If you forget, I will interrupt you and ask you to do so. If you need more than three minutes or more than five minutes when speaking to a motion, you must request additional time before speaking and town meeting will vote on your request. If you're speaking from the floor, please speak into a microphone that will be provided for you. Um, the microphone will be on when it is handed to you. Please hold it close to your mouth when you speak. And I presumably this is because even though there's not a live audience, this will be taped so people can watch it on reruns later and they won't hear you unless you use the microphone. Non-members who wish to speak should stand at the rear of the right-hand aisle, the one in front of me. Any registered voter of the town of Amherst who is recognized by the moderator may speak without special permission. Others may speak with the permission of a majority. If you're making an amendment to a motion, the amendment must be presented in writing with four copies submitted to the front table. Copy machine is located at the table to my right. This may be used to make copies of amendments. Procedural motions, such as a motion to refer or a motion to dismiss, do not need to be presented in writing. If you make any motion on the floor, it must be the first thing you do after you've been recognized and have identified yourself. You cannot speak first and then make a motion. If you've not already done so, please check your cell phone and make sure it is silenced and turned off. Um, we got our quorum right at 7.10 tonight, which is not great, but it's still pretty good. So let's keep it up. Let's see if we can go back to 7.09 for the next meeting. Um, as you can see on the board there, there's information about the Memorial Day Parade. I don't have to read it because you can do so. Tonight is also the last night to submit corrections to the League of Women Voters document that lists all town meeting member names and phone numbers. So if you haven't done so yet, check the spelling, make sure you're listed correctly, and submit a correction if you need to. If at any point in time you're confused about the proceedings, it is appropriate to call a point of order and ask for a clarification. Also, it's always okay to phone me, send me an email, or see me prior to town meeting if you need an explanation of any kind. We are beginning tonight with Article 34. Then we have 35, 36, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. After we get to 42, we have the special town meeting scheduled for June 2nd, and then Articles 20C and 34, which will follow the special town meeting. As I said, we begin tonight with Article 34, and I call on Nancy Gregg to make a motion. Nancy Gregg from Precinct 3, and I'm co-chair of the Housing and Sheltering Committee. I move in terms of the article, except for removing the stricken language and inserting in its place that which is bold in the paragraph numbered one and subsection E as follows. 
Section 1, there shall be a board of, direct, a board of trustees of the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust Fund composed of seven members, of whom one shall be a member of the select board, one shall be a member of the Housing and Sheltering Committee, five shall be qualified residents who would bring to the trust relevant personal and or professional experience and knowledge in the fields of real estate, finance, affordable housing, banking, architecture, social services, or the like. The select board shall appoint the trustees for terms not to exceed two, not to exceed two years, except for the th uh, the, that three of the initial trustee appointments shall be for a term of one year so as to allow staggered terms. Said trustees may be appointed at the discretion of the select board. Vacancies shall be filled by the select board for the remainder of the expired term. Any member of the board of trustees may be removed by the select board for a cause after the opportunity of a hearing. Nothing in this section shall prevent the select board from appointing the town manager as an ex officio eighth member without the power to vote. Then section 3E, to employ advisors and agents such as accountants, appraisers, and lawyers as the board deems necessary, notwithstanding administrative and technical support provided through finance, treasurer slash collector, and accounting departments, and that which may be provided by town staff in various departments, including but not limited to planning, inspection services, and conservation. I would like to submit the rest of my time to Greg Stutzman. Hang on just a second. Do I hear a second, first of all? Sorry. Okay, and who would you would like, hang on, let me just take this out. Yes, Mr. Stutzman will be speaking to the yes. motion. And Mr. Stutzman, you have five minutes to speak to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just waiting for my visuals here. Article 34 seeks to give Amherst a vital tool in addressing its goal of providing housing that is affordable to the broadest possible spectrum of our community. Next slide, please. The Amherst Housing Production Plan, accepted by the town and approved by the Commonwealth in 2013, provided an in-depth look at the state of affordable housing in Amherst. While the town has made much progress in this area, the plan shows that many of the families and residents in our community are increasingly unable to afford to purchase or rent a home in Amherst because of the high cost of housing. The plan identifies establishing a municipal affordable housing trust fund as the top priority in helping to increase affordable housing in our community. In 2005, the state passed the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund law. This new law effectively simplified the process of establishing a local housing trust fund. Previously, only cities could create trusts through their own resolution, but towns needed to gain approval from the legislature through a time-consuming home rule petition. Under the 2005 law, communities can now create a local housing trust through their own local legislative body. The law also sets guidelines on what local housing trusts can do, specifies who can serve on a local housing trust board, and what powers a community can grant the board. Prior to the 2005 law, there were no guidelines, and local housing trusts often differed from community to community. Since the law passed, approximately 70 communities in Massachusetts have established municipal affordable housing trust funds, raising the overall total of communities with local housing trusts to approximately 80. Here's a sampling of what some communities throughout the state have accomplished with their municipal affordable housing trust funds. The Westward Affordable Housing Trust Fund has preserved two affordable units that were at risk of expiring affordability restrictions. Both units had previously been subject to affordability deed riders that did not provide the same protections that the state's universal deed rider does. The trust was able to update the deed riders and preserve the affordable units. The Sudbury Housing Trust proactively monitored affordable units and performed lottery and resale agent services, including marketing units and selecting and qualifying residents for affordable units. The trust is an approved agent by Department of Housing and Community Development and Mass Housing. Yarmouth's trust oversees a program that creates affordable units through the acquisition of market rate units and resale to first time home buyers with household income at or below 80% area median income. Like these other communities, a trust in Amherst would help address a number of needs, including rental housing for families and for individuals, preservation and improvement of existing affordable housing, 
affordable homeownership for families, and housing for at-risk and special needs populations. A trust brings many benefits to a community. A trust could help streamline the public funding process, which is essential for smaller developments that typically access municipal funds and cannot absorb costs of a long project. A trust could provide support for construction of affordable housing. It could purchase property for affordable housing use. It could preserve properties with expiring affordability restrictions. And it could provide funds for housing rehabilitation. It could also advocate for and facilitate the creation of more affordable housing. By incorporating all of the powers included under the 2005 state statute, Amherst's trust would be able to pursue any of these strategies. This flexibility is vital in an environment in which levels of funding are uncertain. Trusts are typically funded by dedicated recurring and non-recurring revenue sources. Some possible sources of funding for an affordable housing trust can include community preservation funds, funds derived from inclusionary zoning requirements, private fundraising, donations and bequests, and loan repayments. The trust would be overseen by a board of trustees. There would be seven of these. One member of the select board, one member of the housing and sheltering committee, and five residents who would bring to the trust personal and or professional knowledge of affordable housing, real estate, finance, social services, or the like. This definition is expanded in the motion from the version in the warrant. The reason for the change is to include those who may have extensive experience in affordable housing and related matters, but not be professionals in those fields. Article 34 would allow Amherst to establish a municipal affordable housing trust. In doing so, we would join many others throughout Massachusetts who have chosen this vital tool as one means to address the pressing need for affordable housing in our communities. The Housing and Sheltering Committee voted unanimously to support Article 34. I thank you for your time and ask you to support this article. Thank you. Ms. Brewer for the Select Board. On April 22nd, the Select Board voted unanimously to recommend this article. As is greatly my want, I'm going to show you pieces of paper. So, the April 28th revised Select Board report talks about why we recommended this. At the time we originally saw the article, it did not have the final motion wording, but we said what we thought made sense for the final motion wording, and we therefore have also approved this final motion wording that you picked up on the table tonight. Also available previous town meeting sessions were this beautiful map, the League of Women Voters position, and also a very extensive sort of frequently asked questions, also known as a brochure. If you have a question that hasn't been answered here, I will be surprised. So um, <laughs> there we go with that. But again, the select board voted unanimously to recommend this trust. This trust has been before town meeting before, but in a different format. It was many years ago. The Housing and Sheltering Committee has been working on this version for over two years, has consulted with any number of various agencies in terms of developing the best possible plan, which they brought forward to you now. Thank you. And Ms. Ratner for the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee recommends this article unanimously, five to zero, with one absent, um, and our reasoning is in our Finance Committee report. Thank you. Thank you. This will require just a majority vote to pass. It is not a change to the zoning bylaw, so it does not require a two-thirds. I have a couple people who have requested to speak. I'm going to call on them first and then open it up to the body. So first, Martha Hanner, who's the local action chair of the League of Women Voters of Amherst. Good evening. Should be on. I am Martha Hanner, local action chair for the Amherst League of Women Voters. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. The League of Women Voters of Amherst supports Article 34, establishment of a municipal affordable housing trust. We believe that such a trust will aid creation and preservation of affordable housing here in Amherst for the benefit of low and moderate income families. The trust could be a useful vehicle for acquiring suitable property or dwelling units to expand the affordable housing base. We see that a major advantage would be that of flexibility, since the trust would be able to accept money or property from various sources and could act in a timely manner when an opportunity arises, particularly when some opportunities that have a very constrained time period. The League supports access to decent housing and a suitable living environment affordable to all. We comment on individual town meeting warrant articles when these articles are relevant to published local, state, or national positions. Our league positions are based on members studying issues and coming to a general agreement or consensus 
on the uh, issues. So we urge town meeting to support an affordable housing trust as one of the many tools toward the goal of increasing affordable housing in Amherst. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to call on Sharon Daughtry. And are you a registered voter in Amherst? Yes, I am. Then you may speak. Um, microphone, please. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to speak about what low-income housing is. Most people who get low-income housing are labeled lazy people who don't want to work or working off the system. They're not lazy people who don't want to work. A lot of them are seniors. A lot of them are vets. A lot of them are disabled individuals. A lot of them are people who are families who may have lost their job or their position in life. And the income they're living on is barely helping them to make it. They need the low income housing and it's not enough of it to go around and they have to fight too hard to get it. And this long wait list, um, you go into low income housing, you could be on a wait list for almost eight to 10 years. You could pass away by the time you get on. It shouldn't take that long. Things need to be set up that are easier for people to get on low income housing, to be able to find it. And the difference between um, low income housing, especially for disabled is the type of housing Many of them are wheelchairs, many of them, I don't use a cane, but those like me, there's balance issues, um, there's wheelchair issues. You need doorways that are wide enough. You need bathrooms that are accessible with railings and handrails and white tubs and step-in tubs and things where you're not gonna fall down and lose your balance. And a regular apartment can't do that. A lot of landlords are not gonna change their apartment over because you're not gonna be living there that long as far as they're concerned. It may be too expensive, and they're not looking favorable on you being low income to begin with because they feel they can get more income from people who can pay higher rents, especially students. And students seem to be beating out low income housing in Amherst and it's becoming a problem. And it just really needs to be addressed. And I'm hoping that we'll see changes for the more positive things in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Oldham, you wish to be recognized? Jim Oldham, Jim Oldham, Precinct 5, uh, I move to refer this back to the Housing and Sheltering Committee. Second. I hear a spec second. You have five minutes to speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so first I want to say I share the strong sense, the, the clock should be on, um, no. I share the strong sense that um, we need to do something about housing, affordable housing in town. Uh, and I hope and feel, I, I, I think it is an urgent uh, thing, urgent need. And um, I, I've been trying my best to, to encourage others to think it's urgent. The question I have is whether this particular article at this time, I think I have five minutes from the start, and it was started yeah. now late, but it should have been at five, thank you. Um, the, uh, the concept, I, I think, may well be what we need, but I, I think it certainly needs fine-tuning and further discussion. Uh, I have a number of concerns on the one hand about the way it's written currently, and I think that the fact is, while the need for affordable housing is a truly urgent need in our town, the need for a housing trust is not something that will change, that, that that waiting six months or, or, or longer to get this right will change anything. There's, no, there's, there's nothing we can't do now uh, that, the, that are setting up in a housing trust that's not funded yet would, would allow us to do over the summer. So I think that there's time to get this right. So my concern is we're talking about setting up a committee, uh, an appointed committee that would be receiving funds and spending funds with, with on its own, it's, it's a very unusual type of body. We have elected bodies like the Housing Authority that can manage money, uh, and, and of course town meeting does most of our appropriations. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about an appointed committee 
uh, not accountable, that would do much of his business by necessity in, in executive session, that would be receiving funds, spending so funds, owning property, and so on. And I think that we need to ask ourselves whether we need to write the purpose as widely as it's been written, or whether we ought to be focusing on what are the needs that aren't being addressed and can't be addressed currently by the CPA committee, by the town meeting, by the select board, and focus a proposal more narrowly. The, the uh, proposing committee has written, has opted for flexibility, and I sympathize with that. We don't know how we'll need this committee to work, so we'll write the law, use all the rights that are available in the law. But the, I would argue that, that this is a committee that once created continues until it winds itself up. I, to the best of my understanding, the state law doesn't give town meeting a chance to, to remove the committee, to shut it down once it's established. So, so I think that we should move with caution. Um, I have some particular concerns. I appreciate the changes in the language regarding the composition of the committee, but I think we could go farther to ensure that there are members, will be members on it, who, who have experienced and understand uh, being low income, have renters, have, have a breadth of, of knowledge uh, that goes beyond uh, financial expertise and real estate expertise and, and, and things like that. Um, uh, currently, uh, we, we tend to have the same people on, on the same committees, often with multiple positions. I, I, I'm concerned about uh, accountability uh, in terms of the fact that this committee, although there are term limits, terms can be repeated. There's no language in this to say you can't serve 10, 10 terms in a row. So the, again, uh, here's a committee with a lot of power and there's not uh, a lot of oversight. Uh, there's a problem with checks and balances that, that is structural that, that we should look at. This is a committee that would be uh, appointed and chaired by the select board, receiving funds from a CPA committee that's also appointed by the select board. And then spending those funds, again, with no further oversight. Uh, we might need to look at, uh, but the state law requires this committee to be appointed and, and, and chaired by the select board, but we might need to look at, you know, how we, how we ch if, if it's possible to change what we do with the, the CPA committee. Again, I absolutely believe we need to be doing everything in our power to, to promote affordable housing. But the fact is that there's much that much of what we saw on the screen that other towns are doing, Amherst has done. We funded affordable housing in a variety of ways. The select board, if they choose, can convene a special town meeting in rapid order, just as they did this March when we needed a special town meeting for, for that article about uh, raising the minimum wage. They did it very quickly, they got us here, they can also ask the CPA committee to act quickly. So when we need efficiency of action, if we're, if we're willing, we can act quickly. Um, so, so there's a lot of things we can do with the tools we have, and my question to the committee, and my reason to refer it, is to ask uh, them to focus this proposal to, to tell us what are the gaps we're trying to fill and focus the proposal on those gaps and address some of these other questions about accountability, checks and balances, and real representation on this committee to assure us that if we do create a committee with this level of power, that it truly be representative of the whole community and not, um, not uh, uh, what, what we tend to get. And again, there isn't a rush. We don't have inclusionary zoning fees in lieu of coming in now to fund this uh, housing trust. And uh, we, we won't have CPA funds till the fall to vote for it. So this, this could certainly wait till the fall, perhaps a little longer. I hope you'll vote to refer. Uh, if not, I, if, if we can't refer, I'll be voting against, which is effectively the same thing. Thank you. Okay, so just want to remind people, the motion before us is now a motion to refer, which requires a majority to pass. If it passes, we are done with Article 34. If the motion to refer fails, we are back to the main motion, which also requires a majority. I'm going to give a lot of leeway in terms of speaking 
for or against the motion to refer in conjunction with speaking for or against the main motion. The lines are pretty blurry. So if you want to speak in favor of the main motion, against refer, for refer, they're all acceptable at the same time. And is there discussion? Um, yes, right there. James Scott, Precinct 7. I am rising to uh, ask your vote against the motion to refer. Uh, and my reason for that is I have confidence in those that presented the article and those that have support, spoken in support of it. And I ask your concurrence uh, in both of those situations. I think they've given it deep thought and due consideration and it's up to us to make the motion, uh, to vote on the motion as it was presented originally. Thank you. Um, yes, in the back there. Um, Pat Church, Precinct 5. Um, this is not easy for um, someone who's not in either real estate or a lawyer or law, or a lawyer who specializes in real estate to really get into. I, f I do agree with the motion to refer, and I would like to just highlight a couple areas where I felt especially concerned. Um, in section four, um, at, the top of, at the top of page 27, um, the, this group of people would be allowed to employ people such as accountants, appraisers, lawyers, and then they would pay them whatever. And then in G, they would um, be able to deal with receipts from their, their actions and create reserves for a lot of um, reasons. But the main thing that I found uncomfortable as a member of town meeting is number K, where they are allowed to borrow on such terms and conditions and from such sources as they feel advisable and to create mortgages, I mean to enter into mortgages. Um, I feel personally, as a member of town meeting, as though that does take something that we take very seriously in town meeting, which is borrowing. Um, it takes us out of our hands. And I, I'm just uncomfortable with that. I think that's my, um, and all the things in this that talk about managing this property, I don't, I don't know that when I, when I was on the solid waste committee, for instance, we didn't manage the transfer station, but we, um, you know, I think this is over and beyond what a committee like this should do. We do have the ability to give um, monies that are collected for projects to the Kestrel Trust, to other places. There are other ways to do this. This town has bought a lot of conservation land and hasn't needed a town entity to do it uh, specifically. Um, the, the, seat, the community preservation money is very helpful and that is even a way to put money into like reserve, kind of it's a special reserve. And we're doing that actually. We have savings there for, um, for use. So I'm gonna vote, vote against the, um, this motion if it's not referred back. Thank you very much. Um, I heard a point of order. Was it about the clock not working? It was. Yes, um, and it's not working, in which case I have my handy iPhone up here, and I will keep track and probably just tell people when their time is up and to finish up, and everyone's gonna have to be a little more focused and keep track of their time. But I, they'll keep an eye too, and I bet they get it working. Maybe they get it working. Is there further discussion? Um, Yes, third row from the back in the middle there. Hi, Caroline Murray, Precinct 4. Uh, a little bit about my background. I moved here 30 years ago and was a student at UMass. 
uh, after traveling a bit, I ended up settling here in Puffton Village 4, which used to be affordable housing. At the same time, I began a career in organizing and spent most of the last 20 years preserving affordable housing around the country. Worked on passing legislation called the Low Income Housing Preservation and Resident Home Ownership Act, which was responsible for preserving hundreds of thousands of units around the country. Revised the Low Income Housing Tenant, Low Income Housing Tax Credit legislation. Worked at the state level on home funds and on various pieces of legislation to preserve affordable housing. At the same time, we organized tenants to preserve and purchase and create tenant controlled housing in over 5,000 units. The Berkshires, Pittsfield, Westfield, Holyoke, Longmeadow, Springfield, Northampton, and yes, Puffton Village. However, at closing at Puffton Village, the former town meeting member, Stephen Puffer, didn't come to our closing. Some of you may remember this. We brought a group of tenants to his house that night. We begged him to come to the closing because what had happened was President Clinton had actually cut the funding that was funding this buyout. We were about $200,000 short. He refused to do it. It's a business transaction. I can tell you without hesitation that if this housing trust fund had been in place, we would have been able to close that buyout. Without hesitation. We were also trying to purchase Rolling Green, but we did not have any earnest money to gain site control. Had this been in place, Rolling Green would not currently be a problem in the town of Amherst. Affordable housing preservation requires access to upfront capital so you can get into negotiations with the owner before they find another purchaser. You need to hire professionals to complete capital needs assessments, you need attorneys, and you need to complete a sources and uses so that you can then apply for further funds. That is the purpose of this trust fund. It is not anything in secret. It's not meant to be a secret slush fund for certain people. And I'd just like to call your attention to number four on page 27. These powers shall be subject to the following limitations. Any purchase, sale, lease, exchange, transfer, or conveyance of any interest in real property must be approved by five of the seven voting members. The trustees may incur debt, a concern of a previous speaker, borrow money, grant mortgages, and pledge trust assets only in an amount not to exceed 80% of the trust's total assets. It is not going to send the town of Amherst into a doom of debt. It is going to help us preserve affordable housing, which every single person in this room says they care about. Let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I wholeheartedly support this, and I thank the Housing and Sheltering Committee for writing it. Um, yes, right here in the front. Sir, Kelly, Precinct 5, call the question. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. Um, we will now come to a vote to see if we're ready to end debate on the motion to refer. All those in favor of the motion of the previous question, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Moderator does not hear two-thirds. We will continue discussion. Is there further discussion? <laughs> um, yes, third row from the back right there. Elder Greenbaum, Precinct 1. I have a question uh, in response to the previous speaker. What if a commitment is made for an apartment complex in town and town meeting doesn't agree with that commitment. Can we retract it? Anybody in Mr. Stutzman, anybody care to try and answer that? Um, no one's required to answer, so we'll just let that one out there. Yes, right there on the aisle. John Hornick. Precinct 7. Um, I'm not sure of the answer to the question that was just raised, but I believe that if the Housing Trust Fund did not have sufficient funds to purchase a property and needed to go to another entity like the CPA, wh whose funds do require approval of town meeting, then town meeting could effectively kill such a deal. And at this point in time, it seems unlikely that the Housing Trust Fund would have the amount of money. Um, I am a member of the Housing and Sheltering Committee. Obviously, I do favor uh, this proposed article. I hope the last the previous speaker will volunteer for the trust fund, because we definitely need people who are knowledgeable and experienced to move forward. 
I think, as she said, here we have a problem with the perfect being the enemy of the good. I'm not going to argue that this is indeed a perfect article, <laughs> that it wouldn't benefit from a little tinkering. But I just don't think it's necessary. I think this is the time to pass the Housing Trust Fund. If we encounter problems later, I'm guessing the town meeting would in fact have the authority to make changes, to make it clear to the trust fund itself that it was in disagreement with things the trust fund was doing. The trust fund is accountable. All of its actions have to be public unless it goes into executive session under special circumstances. It, its meetings are open. And I, I just don't think that uh, there are so many bogeymen, if you like, hiding behind this article that it justifies not taking it seriously, not passing it, not doing what we can to speak to, to act in favor of the crisis of affordable housing that we currently experience in Amherst. Thank you. Um, yes, from the Finance Committee. I just want to uh, read section, um, part four, section C. Any debt incurred by the board shall not constitute a pledge of the full faith and credit of the town of Amherst. And all documents related to any debt shall contain a statement that the holder of any such debt shall have no recourse against the town of Amherst with an acknowledgement of said statement by the holder. So the town is not going to be liable for any debt that the, this board incurs. Let's see, second row from the back right there. Mary Wentworth, Precinct 5. Um, my concern uh, is that um, there is no way once this uh, committee uh, has been appointed for residents to have anything to say about it. Um, I would be um, happier about this if members were elected uh, by the town rather than being an appointed body because uh, elected people uh, can uh, be defeated in a following election, unlike appointed people who tend, who will tend to be reappointed. Um, and I think that this is um, uh, a, uh, an idea, a, a proposal that is more suitable to a larger municipality like a city. I think it's really a bit too high powered uh, for uh, a town like Amherst. So I'm going to vote uh, to refer this. Mr. Stutzman. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to the point about appointments versus elections. The appointment choice is not a choice at all. It's taken from statute. So that's why we have the positions being appointed. And there's also been comments about oversight and the town and town meeting not having control over this board of, once it's formed. And to that I would say that this is not capitalizing the trust. We're not giving the trust any money at this point. If the trust wants to seek CPA funds or seek funds from town meeting, town meeting has to approve those. And if town meeting approves those funds open-endedly, that is knowing that it's going to be used for an unknown meaning of the future, which is the flexibility we've been looking for, town meeting would have to vote to do so. So I think the oversight issue is perhaps not as grave as has been expressed. Um, yes, right down here, second row, center. Stand, stand up so that, or wave your hand or something. Yes, you, so they know it's you. Ellie Manier Gotti, uh, I just feel somehow low-income people should be included in decisions made. I'm sorry, on what precinct are you? I'm sorry, precinct eight. Thanks. 
it's much different to be a low-income person than it is to be a middle-class person. And there's shame, uh, humiliation, and I just think that they could bring something special to such a committee. Um, way in the back there. Abby Jensen, Precinct 4, I call the previous question. Motion for the previous question has been made and seconded. We will now come to immediate vote. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will come to a vote on the motion before us. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. Moderator hears two-thirds. We have two-thirds. We will now come to a vote on the motion to refer Article 34 back to the Housing and Sheltering Committee. Um, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the motion to refer, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. No. The no's have it. We now have the main motion back on the floor. Is there further discussion before we come to a vote? Um, I see a hand in the back there, back row. Good evening. My name is Nelson Acosta. I want to disclose that I was a welfare kid. I'm sorry, precinct? Precinct 8. Thanks. I was a welfare kid. I was the first one to go to college. My family, my mom went to sixth grade. My father went to sixth grade. My father went to sixth grade. First one to get a college degree. I lived in Puffton Village, and I actually knew Mr. Puffer. And I lived there before I went to what they call the market value. I also lived in Rolling Green before I went to the market value. There is an issue that I deeply care, and I think the spirit of it is good. I do feel like Mary that I have, do have concerns about accountability. The town of Amherst does not have a good history of doing things for people of color or for working class people. We do have the example of Echo Hill. Do people remember that? And we do have the example of Puffton Village, and we have many other examples. And I have to agree with Mary, and I have to agree with the previous speaker, that I think some of us should be concerned who gets appointed to that committee. So I am going to vote against it, okay, because of the process, not because of the spirit. I think we do need to do something. Uh, but I don't think, I think that there are some issues that need should be resolved before. I think we should put the horse before the cart, and I think we're putting the cart before the horse. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Um, yes, in the center, second row from the back. Mary Streeter, Precinct 8. I'm glad to see that there are some initiatives toward getting more affordable housing. On the CPA committee uh, last winter, we had a community land trust come before us, and they opted because they wanted to make sure that their proposal was in um, excellent <coughs> shape. Before it got voted, they opted to um, withdraw it temporarily, and I believe they've been working on it in the meantime. Um, I would have voted for referral, I did vote for re to refer this article, but I think now I'm gonna vote no for a number of reasons. Um, one thing that concerns me is that when, on the CPA committee, we have a permanent affordable housing restriction that's required, and I can't recall seeing that in here, but on page six of the um, handout that we received from the Housing Committee, it's revised um, April 14th. It, the last line of the last paragraph on page six <laughs> says, the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust Fund is not limited to working with housing that is included on the subsidized housing inventory. Um, those are the countable units um, that would help us keep the 10% that we need to keep in order for a Chapter 40B to take effect, which could override our zoning. Um, I'm also concerned about that someone could be um, eliminated from the committee by the select board after a hearing for cause. I don't understand what for cause means. And there are a few other things that concern me too, so I urge people to vote no. I'm sure that we'll see this come back again, hopefully with a, a little more clarity. Yes, Ms. Kruger. Um, I'd like to just say a couple of things. I've been listening to comments, and I know that 
the Housing and Sheltering Committee has been working on this for a long time, and they're actually following models that have been developed statewide. And in fact, Ms. Brewer's thumbing through the book, and I wanted to hold it up. So um, some of you may know I have a background in affordable housing. I actually helped work on the guidebook for municipal affordable housing trusts that the Massachusetts Housing Partnership did. Um, this um, version that you're seeing, I don't think is imperfect or needs a lot of work. You could, you could probably argue one small piece or another, but they're actually doing this according to best practices. And another speaker talked about this, Amherst is too small. Well, this is actually designed for small towns. And of the 70 communities you saw on the map, many of them are smaller than Amherst. Once the state um, gave us the Community Preservation Act, law and then it was adopted by you know, 100 and something communities, it uh, was realized that trusts were a very good mechanism for using CPA monies. I like to say they marry together very well. So I'm, I've been wanting Amherst to have a housing trust like the 70 other communities for many years, but it, it never seems to quite hit a standard that people feel they can trust and that's kind of embedded in the name. Um, the reason there's representation from the town manager and the select board is this isn't a group that just goes off on their own. They have a close link to your municipal government. It's working in um, open meeting, except for certain purchases of real estate. I doubt that a trust with no money is gonna be able to get a mortgage for you know a couple hundred thousand dollars. So. Um, I think when, when we're ready to see the trust buy a large apartment complex, um, I, I, I would long for that day. But I think this is a small step in finding the best way to spend our community preservation dollars in certain circumstances. We're long familiar with the Kestrel Trust, and people are fine with that model. We don't have equal flexibility on the housing side of things to do some of the things that the trust can do. So I would really strongly urge you, after many years in the works, to get it done tonight and to approve the Municipal Affording, Affordable Housing Trust for Amherst. Um, yes, in the green right there for throw, yes. Claire Bertrand, Precinct 8. I'm going to rise in support of this article. I appreciate the comments um, Ms. Kruger shared regarding her history and, um, and the fact that this is based on state law. Um, I'm hearing a lot of concern, but I'm not hearing specifics enough that make me feel like we have to fix this. Um, I think we need tools. This is an important tool. We're committed to affordable housing. I think we have to put our money where our mouth is. Um, yes, way back in the corner there, you. Yes. Carolyn, Carolyn Holstein, Precinct 2, I call the previous question. Motion of the previous question has been made and second. We will now come to a vote to end debate. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. No. Moderator hears two thirds. We will now come to a vote on the main motion before us under Article 34. This also requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the motion under Article 34, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. We now move on to Article 35. And I call on Ms. Kruger to make a motion. I move in terms of the article, except to change the first sentence in the last paragraph by removing the stricken language and inserting that which is italicized in its place as follows. Each year, the local chapter of the Western Massachusetts Workers' Rights Board shall, which will be stricken out, is requested to provide the Human Rights Commission with a list of employers who respond affirmatively to section one and two of the article. Do I hear a second? I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. Okay. 
This article is for approval of a resolution sponsored by the town's Human Rights Commission. On April 16th, the select board voted unanimously to recommend approval of this article. Um, you're looking, this is Article 35, Right to Organize. This resolution is an important affirmation of our community values. The town of Amherst is an employer who does recognize its employees' right to organize. This resolution asks all employers in Amherst to respect the legal rights of workers to organize in the workplace and to remain neutral on these effects. The resolution asks for voluntary participation by employers and provides for a mechanism, a list, to make known which employers have chosen to affirm the actions described in the resolution. This article is similar to an article passed in 1998. So we have a history in affirming through town meeting the act, this action for workers' rights, right to organize. And I know um, there is somebody here from the Human Rights Commission, um, and I will, when, when they're- Yes, recognized. I'll be calling Yes, yeah, that um, they may be able to um, add to that. Um, and actually, I'm calling on Deborah Radway, who's the Director of Human Resources and Human Rights. Good evening. On behalf of Chair Greg Bascom, the Human Rights Commission voted on January 16th, 2014, to sponsor the Right to Organize resolution. The resolution speaks directly to Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is why its path to town meeting came through the Human Rights Commission and the Western Mass Workers' Rights Board. Um, I'm going to ask the moderator if he would uh, recognize John Weissman, who is the coordinator of the Western Mass Jobs for Justice. Yes, I will recognize Mr. Weissman. Um, sir, are you a registered voter in Amherst? No, sir. Um, all those in favor of allowing Mr. Weissman to speak, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. No. You may speak. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you to the town meeting members. The uh, goal of this resolution is cultural. It's creating a climate in the valley. We are working this resolution or a version of it in every city and town where we have activists who believe that the right to organize is under siege in America. So I'm really here to help people understand what we would do with the results of your vote. If you have questions, um, I think we've already heard the rationale for it. Thank you. Um, are you done with your three minutes? No, you're, we're not doing a question and answer thing. You have three minutes to speak, and when you're done, then uh, um, I will just wait and see if you could, uh, if I could help you answer any questions that come up. Okay, you can take a seat up here, and if you're needed, we can call on you. Um, I now call on Ms. Moran from the Finance Committee. We have no recommendation on this because we don't see any financial consequences to the town. Thank you. Article 35 requires a majority vote to pass. Um, I now call on Nolan Anaya, who is asked to be recognized. Okay, he does not need to be recognized after all. Is there any discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands. We will now come to a vote on the motion before us under Article 35. It requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. no. The ayes have it. We now move on to Article 36, which is being divided into two motions. And I call on Mr. Gotti to make the first motion. So all you need to do to make the motion is read that top sentence. Uh, I, 
I move that town meeting endorse Article 36. There are two resolutions to start with. I'm sorry. This is, could you come up here a second? Sure. Could you hear one too? Stay right here. Read this line into this microphone. Read that first sentence. I move that town meeting endorse part A of the motion under Article 36 as it appears on the screen. Thank you. Oh, I want that back though. Sorry about that, I just wanted to make sure we got that right. So the motion was just made under part A, which appears on the screen, and Mr. And I believe um, Mr. Paul Voss is going to speak to this motion. Um, yes, Mr. and also to remind you that there are written articles at the back if you'd like to have it. Um, uh, Paul is a... Uh, um, let him introduce himself, please, Mr. Voss. Okay. And he's been... Um, Mr. Gotti has requested that Mr. Voss speak to Part A of the motion under yeah, Part A. Okay. So you should identify yourself and you have five minutes to speak to the motion. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me here, Frank. Um, my name is Paul Voss. I'm an engineering professor at Smith College and um, I work with uh, drone technology for environmental research. Um, and I want. Uh, is it? Yeah. Yep, just get that. Um, so I'm a, a professor of engineering at Smith College and I work with drone I'm sorry. technology. I'm sorry. Yes, I didn't. Are you a resident? Are you a registered voter in Amherst? I, I'm not a registered voter of Amherst. Um, I was, I'll, I'll call a vote. Um, he's been asked to speak to the motion, which is a little bit more of a privileged position, but we'll still ask. Um, all those in favor of allowing Mr. Voss to speak to the motion, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. no. You may continue. Okay. So I'm here to talk to you about uh, the part A of the resolution that's before you tonight. Um, and I was invited by Frank Gotti. So uh, first of all, a couple words about uh, what drones are. Um, it, they seem like science fiction, but they're very common and, uh, and, and out there now uh, on the, excuse me a sec. So over here is an example of a Parrot drone. It uh, you know, uh, can be bought for $300 and flies around with a camera. You can fly it with your iPhone and see what's out of the camera, like the view in the bottom uh, here. And so the question in this resolution addresses is where should these things be able to fly? Should they be able to f freely go through our neighborhoods and backyards, or do we uh, have some control over this technology? Um, this uh, has become a very uh, big industry. Uh, the, this is an example of a drone here. It's a little hummingbird that's being developed by DARPA for uh, surveillance and military uses. Uh, here's a whole line of products made by Aero Environment, a company that um, produces uh, drones for the military and is eyeing the $80 billion, $80 billion with a B, uh, civilian market. Um, so you can imagine there's quite a bit of lobbying uh, on how our airspace is used with this much money at stake. Um, Here's one example, a slide that leaked from the biggest um, uh, uh, advocacy organization for these flying robots. Um, it's AUVSI, and uh, this slide was not supposed to be made public. Um, but here you can see they're boasting about um, uh, the only changes made to the unmanned aircraft sections of the, the federal FAA bill were made at the request of AUBSI. Our suggestions were often taken word for word. Uh, here you can see the little uh, cartoon of the AUVSI uh, industry folks putting thoughts into the government official's head. Um, this, this is the advisory and rulemaking committee for unmanned aircraft. So these are the folks who are telling the FAA how to regulate these very small, what are called aircraft now. Um, and you'll notice, uh, I've, I've highlighted in red, that there's a very uh, lopsided distribution of interests here of uh, defense contractors all the way through. Uh, you can take a look at that later. But these are the people making the rules essentially for your backyards. Um, here are some of the kind of rules they're making. Uh, this is a letter that went out this last spring uh, to uh, Mr. Timmer, who was operating a small quadcopter, essentially what we would think of as a toy or a hobby toy, and using it uh, for commercial purposes. Um, the FAA wrote him a certified letter and said, landowners do not have any jurisdiction over the airspace above their property and cannot prohibit or allow aviation operations over their land. That's fine if we're talking about Cessnas and 747s. It's not okay if you're talking about a little quadcopter that flies six inches off the grass. Here's what the FAA has to say about your authority locally. Local jurisdictions do not have any authority to regulate the use of navigable airspace or the safety of flight operations, and local actions to do so would raise preemption questions. 
Again, that's okay if we're talking about Cessnas and 747s. When you're talking about things flying six inches off the grass in front of town hall, you'd think you'd want some local control. Fortunately, the Supreme Court has our back on this. Um, there's been a long, uh, very long history. Uh, the airspace history is a fascinating topic, but if you um, uh, go back, the landowners have always owned the, the, uh, the airspace above their property, and the Supreme Court affirmed that very strongly in this uh, seminal case in 1946, which has never been overturned or questioned. Um, the Supreme Court said the airspace is a public highway, yet the landowner must have exclusive control of the immediate reaches of the enveloping atmosphere. Even stronger, the landowner owns at least as much of the space above the ground as he can use or occupy in connection with the land. The flight of airplanes which skim the surface but do not touch it is as much an appropriation of the use of the land as more conventional entry upon it. So on the one side, we have FAA and industry. On the other side, we have the Supreme Court. Our, you have one more minute for a little okay. less. Sorry. So on the one side, uh, we have industry fighting for control of everything down to the grass and for using their products in this space. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the Supreme Court, uh, who has stood by the rights of landowners and local communities to control the airspace we live and breathe in. So this uh, resolution here, uh, is, there's two parts. The part that I'm speaking to here uh, really takes language directly from the Supreme Court and affirms that landowners and tenants subject to uh, local uh, state laws and local ordinances have exclusive control of the media reaches of the airspace and that no drone, unmanned aircraft, or other airborne object shall have the public right of transit through this private property. And I would think this would be pretty non-controversial. <laughs> so, um, and very briefly in the last few seconds, I'll speak to uh, part A, which basically uh, uh, declares the town of Amherst uh, shall not operate drones in the immediate airspace in a manner that violates the constitutional right residence of you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I call on Mr. Hayden for the select board. Uh, contrary to what your report says, the uh, select board did not in the end vote to recommend against this article. Uh, the recommendation in the report to town meeting you have was in response to the first version of the article presented to us, which is not the article you see here. We took our decision then because we considered important, and note is important to you, that any article is clear in its object and effective in its method. The original was neither. We did have an opportunity to consider this version of the article with the petitioner when it was still mixed, we had the two ideas mixed together, part A, and which is the local uh, jurisdiction consideration, and part B, which is the international consideration. We took our position of no recommendation because the select board tries not to make recommendations to town meeting on matters of foreign affairs, much as the finance committee doesn't make recommendations on non-financial matters. We have not had time to respond to these two separate articles, but I would note that the second, the, the first part um, does have bearing, the part A, does have bearing on town matters. I can't imagine how annoying or dangerous having these things buzzing around would be should the FAA relent and allow them into the airspace where aircraft are currently forbidden without consideration for our privacy, peace and quiet, or without the supervision of our emergency services. Thank you. And Ms. Moran for the Finance Committee. Well, the Finance Committee uh, did vote to not recommend this article, uh, specifically because of the restriction on the town of Amherst to uh, use drone technology. We could think of uh, several ways in which it would save the town money, it would be more efficient. If you did search and rescue for somebody, a hiker lost in the um, Hoyo Grange, uh, sometimes they call in helicopters for that. Drones would be cheaper and also safer than having helicopters flying over. Uh, mapping for property, uh, checking out if, if uh, ground truthing satellite photos to make sure to get a closer look at what lines and what uh, waterways are actually are. We could think of several ways the town might want to use drone technology, and this resolution appears to ban everything. Thank you. This um, will require a majority vote to pass. And just to clarify, what we're talking about first is motion for part A that's before you on the screen. And when we're done with this, there'll be another motion for part B. Um, I have a small list of people who've requested recognition. I'm gonna 
sort of intersperse that with the body in general. So when I call for hands, um, if you want to speak, you should raise your hand. But first I'm calling on Deborah Radway, Director of Human Resources and Human Rights. Hello again. On May 7th, the Human Rights Commission voted to support both Part A and Part B of this article. Thank you. And um, Matthew Cornell requested to speak. I don't know if he's here tonight. He's not, it looks like. Anybody else wish to speak? Um, yes, right here in the fourth row. Gordon Freed, Precinct 6, um, talked about um, how much space above ground level. Uh, who determines that? Is that based on zoning so that you can only build a two-story house, therefore you're only allowed to preserve as much as the house? Um, uh, Southwest dorm is considerably higher than that, um, et cetera. Try and answer that, Mr. Weisman. I'm sorry, Mr. Boss. I'd, I'd be glad to address that. The, um, the, the Supreme Court has made it very big. They talk about the immediate reaches, and they say that's at least as far as you could occupy. And it's been left vague on purpose, as laws often are. But uh, it's not zero. It's not the grass. And neither is it do you own up to the heavens, as, as people once did a century ago. So. Um, nominally, maybe it's 200 feet or 400 feet, um, but I think we're talking about the, the immediate reaches of the airspace. And uh, one last thing, there was a concern that I think this uh, resolution was aimed at, at curtailing the activities of the town of Amherst's ability to use this technology. And uh, it, actually, the intent is the opposite, in that uh, by claiming the right to use the lowermost reaches of the airspace, that we can start using some of this technology in Northampton uh, now, as we, as we are starting to do. And, and that we can um, sort of pull up a seat at the table where all these special interests are and say, no, wait a second, this is our space. We can decide how to use the, the lower couple hundred feet. Um, so, uh, so no resolution is absolutely binding. It's, it's, I think of it as really uh, pulling up the table and, and raising your voice and, and saying this is our space. And um, Walter Walnick has requested to speak. Point of order, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I've exchanged email uh, um, emails with could you. Could you just identify yourself first? Yes, Walter Wallet, Precinct 5. Yeah. I've exchanged emails with you uh, because of my confusion about how this would all turn out. Uh -huh. And you indicated to me that I could speak against both plan Part A and Part B in, in a statement. Yes. If you're, if you're willing to take your three minutes and speak to both, I will yes. allow it. It will save us time later. So yes, yes. you Thank may you. proceed. Thank you for checking in on that, though. Thank you. Uh, speaking first against Part A, I care so much about privacy, I've gotten IT director Chris Bakunas to remove Google Analytics from the town website and made overtures to get ad trackers off other local civic websites. Almost ubiquitous analytics trackers that track you on the web support way more intrusive surveillance than drones. This is going on already. Drone public safety applications can include search and rescue, but also monitoring large-scale brownie blowout type disturbances. A Gazette story that ran extravaganza weekend spoke of a suspected return of Hobart Hoedown, quoting promotional email advising stealth tactics and not posting about hoedown in advance. Drones could help if police are busy in other parts of town, possibly even having gotten slyly diverted away. Now speaking against Part B, an October 1, 2011 New York Times article told about drone killing in Yemen of American citizens Anwar al-Awlaki and Samir Khan. The less known Khan was an editor of Inspire, Al Qaeda's online English magazine. He edited an article with the catchy title, Make a Bomb in the Kitchen of Your Mom, describing 
pressure cooker design used years later in the, at the Boston Marathon finish line. Alaki is a cleric known for having inspired the first Fort Hood mass shooting. Other plots Alaki is linked to by mainstream media press accounts failed, but all would have taken innocent lives. In two cases, huge numbers of lives. Christmas 2009, on a flight landing in Detroit, the underwear bomber was subdued after his clothing uh, only caught fire. Roughly, that would have been roughly 300 innocent lives. The foiled May 1, 2010 Times Square car bombing could have resulted in untold casualties. President Obama was able to use a special forces raid to get Osama bin Laden hiding in a safe house in Abbottabad, Pakistan. According to that October 1, 2011 Times story, attempts to use special forces on the ground to get Alaki and Khan were also made, but didn't pan out as Yemeni tribes uh, protected them too well, so drones were turned to. Obama taught constitutional law. He carried out his responsibility to protect America against attack under the Constitution's Article II authority. Um, I'd like to very respectfully and politely ask that whoever is here with this adorable child, please ask her to be still and not be circling around so much. I fear it's distracting to people. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yes, front corner right there. Uh, John Fox, Precinct 10. Um, I'm interested in the comment by the Finance Committee, or Ms. Moran. I'm directing it to you, Mr. Moderator. But um, it says that the, the town will operate, uh, will operate drones in the immediate airspace in a manner that, that it cannot violate the constitutional rights of its residents. And so I'm wondering why you're concerned that the town can't do things and rescues in other ways as long as they're not violating the rights, the constitutional rights of residents. Uh, if you could clarify that for me. Ms. Moran? I think we felt that was rather vague. Um, if you're conducting a search and rescue operation, you may also be flying over somebody's backyard who is, is expecting privacy in their backyard. Um, if you're the same with any kind of uh, operation like that, if you're trying to find a fugitive who's running away, you're going to be possibly violating the rights of some of the people. If you're monitoring, looking for outbreaks of Hobart Hoedown in other parts of town, you might be violating the constitutional, or be construed as violating the constitutional rights of those students to free assembly. Thank you. Um, I see somebody at the back of this row. Would you like to be recognized? Please identify yourself. You can come up or stay back there, whichever you want, and please identify yourself first. And my name is Bill Newman. And are you a registered voter in Amherst? I am not, sir. All those in favor of giving Mr. Newman permission to speak to the meeting, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. You have three minutes. You may proceed. I'd like to uh, ask you to take a look at the actual words of the resolution and note that this is a resolution. It's telling elected officials what you want. It's expressing what you think is important. It is affirming constitutional rights. It's not a bylaw. It's not something that has the force of law, but it is important because it, in fact, directs the town in a way, and as previous speakers have said, gives you a seat at the table. First, it says the use of drones raise far-reaching concerns about target government killings, the loss of constitutional protections, privacy, democracy, and the rule of law. I can't see that there's actually much debate about that. Secondly, drones are now being marketed to domestic law enforcement agencies. 
potentially could be armed with weapons. I'd strike potentially if I had my druthers because they can be armed with weapons, including tear gas, rubber bullets, and firearms, and cameras. There's no, there's no debate about that. Drone technology is a means of data collection. It's a potential for misuse. That's clear. Affecting privacy and civil liberties, freedom of association, and so on. There really can't be debate about that. And then we get to the, what is resolved. And again, what, you, what the town of Amherst would be saying in terms of what's important and what are the principles of the town. And one is that the town of Amherst should not operate drones unconstitutionally. If it's, the Constitution is not an idiot. The Constitution does not prohibit search and rescue. The Constitution does not prohibit rescuing kids and the Constitution does not prohibit reasonable law enforcement. To make those arguments, I think, respectfully, is just not true. It's just not right. And in terms of the fifth piece of this, saying that we don't want, you don't want, drones that are managed by the government to be outside your living room window, six inches above your grass, peering into your most private affairs, and to say, we the people of Amherst do not approve of that, we don't want that in our town. I think that that is appropriate. It is what the city of Northampton City Council has done. It is what the Leverett, the people of Leverett and the citizens of Leverett have recently done. It is what cities and towns are doing across the United States because these drone manufacturers have lost their markets in Iraq and Afghanistan and they will be plying the, their trades of making these drones available throughout the United States. It is important that we as citizens say, we need to regulate them, we need to have control over them, and we stand in favor of protection of fundamental constitutional rights. On behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, I would urge you to adopt this resolution. Ms. Moran. Mr. Pooler uh, points out that when we took our vote on this, we were voting on the language that was in the warrant and, and in the motion that we had, the revised motion that we'd seen before that, um, in which it said well, that forbid the town from operating drones capable of violating the constitutional rights of the residents. So what is actually in this motion um, is different. It prohibits, the, uh, it would uh, declare that the town will not operate drones will not operate drones in the immediate airspace over Amherst in a manner that violates the constitutional rights. So our not recommending uh, was in the original language of the warrant article and in this, the first revised motion, not this one. Okay. Way in the back of the blue hat. Barrick Tierkel, Precinct 4. Um, I'm I'm, uh, I have a strong opinion on the privacy of everybody. And um, I think that our privacy is, the government across the, the country is really uh, overreaching its authority uh, in invading our privacy every day. Uh, when you get down to a town level, I'm not happy about cameras that have popped up on so many intersections in Amherst that are accessible by Amherst PD. Um, we're on, on camera really all the time now. Um, I'm not happy in, in some of our retail establishments that you're on camera all the time. Uh, so with that context, I feel that this article really doesn't specifically address that. Um, in fact, I don't, I, from what the previous speakers have said, I don't agree that this really addresses anything other than potentially to uh, stifle innovation. Um, the United States Supreme Court has ruled in their 1946 causal uh, ruling that William O. Douglas wrote, and they have defined what we own in terms of airspace. And that has not, as the previous speaker has, has pointed out very specifically, has never been overturned and has never been, been questioned. Um, and so if you're putting forth an article that says, the town of Amherst will not violate our constitutional rights. I don't think the town of Amherst is allowed by law to violate our constitutional rights, whether we pass this resolution or not. The town is under a requirement not to violate our, our constitutional rights. And where we speak of drones, there is very specific constitutional case law, as you have pointed out, 
that says you can't fly drones over a reasonable amount of airspace uh, that property owners have. So I see that, that this article really just sends a signal that, that drones are bad. And I think uh, from the previous speaker, we just said that we have to send a signal that all these companies who want to make money off drones, we want to send that signal to stop that. I believe that, that drones, as have been pointed out, can be very helpful. Farmers can use them. Um, the fire department can use them. Search and rescue can, can use them. Uh, guides and mapping can use them. Construction industry is using drones left and right. I don't think we need to send a signal that drones are bad. I think we need to send a signal that specific uses of drones are bad. I would love to see a, a, a article that says the town of Amherst will not use drones to monitor the activities of private citizens. I don't know how you would write that, but I'm sure that there's some language that can be very specific instead of what I see here, which is just very general. You won't violate our constitutional rights. Hey, you're not allowed to do that today, no matter how we vote on this. Just a quick reminder, if non-members want to be recognized, they should stand at the back of the aisle in front of me over here. Um, let's see. Yes, second row from the back, right there. Jeff Ballastine, Precinct 6. Uh, first of all, I agree with the previous speaker. I'm voting against both um, Part A and Part B. Part B because I always vote against or abstain from matters of foreign policy. Um, in part A, because of a couple of weeks ago, I was biking by Plumbrook, um, and there was a, a guy, um, a grown-up, not a kid, that was uh, flying a, a quadricopter. And having been a kid that, that uh, made little airplanes with little gas engines and flew them and dreamt of something like that, right now, this, this affirms that we would restrict that use of, of a toy quadricopter, because it doesn't make a distinction between somebody using a quadricopter toy um, on their own land or on a public park where there, weren't anybody, where there wasn't anybody playing soccer um, and, and these other uses. So I'm voting against both parts. Um, yes, Mr. Voss. Just briefly address that. The, the, um, the, the part about the control of the immediate reaches is actually language that I researched very carefully uh, over the last three years. and. Um, it's intended to promote innovation. It's, pretend, it's intended to allow um, use of this technology for the hobbyist, for the real estate agent that wants to take a picture on private property, for the, the person who wants to fly a little thing in a park where the town allows that. It's, this is about local control and it's about accountability. It's about if you see something flying in your neighborhood, it's gonna, you know the landowner and underneath it and that's who it belongs to. It's not gonna be an anonymous thing flying over your house. And it's about connecting the, the if the flying drones to people and to property and, and, and giving you a lot more control locally. So it's not at all about curtailing innovation. In fact, I'll, I'll tell a personal story that, you know, we've had to shut down all research at Smith College because the FAA said you can't touch anything except for recreational purposes, including, and I kid you not, a paper airplane. That they, the, regu the top regulator at one of the conferences, Ted weirs is on one of the slides, said technically a paper airplane would be illegal if we're using it for research purposes. So. These indu this industry wants total control of the airspace. Um, they're boxing a lot of people out, a lot of innovation out, a lot of small business out. And this uh, claiming control of the airspace is a much bigger deal than you realize. It's not affirming what the Supreme Court has already said. The industry and, and our FAA would like to forget that Cosby, USV Cosby, ever existed. And they're moving forward as if it didn't. And we are reminding them that, uh, no, we control the immediate reaches. That's all. Thanks. Um, yes, the back corner right there. Yes. Ken Tarr, Precinct 1. I think what's really important is to look at its public right of transit. What this is telling us is that we control our own, in the town of Amherst, public right of transit. Once you give away your, pub and you make everybody's land everywhere, part of the public right of transit. You know, this is, this is the problem with drones, is it, all of a sudden they can do, you know, they have uh, access to any airspace anywhere. And aside from whatever the Supreme Court says, we've already, you know, we've seen recently what a change in the Supreme Court can do. So, you know, I don't really think there's a lot of 
fear or concern about the Supreme Court, you know, by the, by the uh, corporations, you know. And the other thing is, is I really don't want, in Part B especially, to be driven by fear. Uh, we've seen what's happened to public, um, to our own personal rights of freedom uh, based on fear. And freedom does have casualties. I mean, if you want to have civil rights, if you want to live in a country that, ha that you have the right to, you know, to a privacy or the right to your opinion or, you know, your right to whatever, own firearms or not own firearms, there's going to be some casualties to that, you know. There's going to be things that you might have to give up in terms of safety or, you know, but I'd rather not live out of fear and, and uh, have my freedom than start allowing things of fear in terms of Part B or commerce in terms of Part A. So I strongly support uh, actually both parts of this. Thank you. Point of order. I hear a point of order. Please wait for a mic and identify yourself. James Smith, Precinct 6. Uh, regarding Part A, uh, subparagraph 5, as to the couple of words, second line, local ordinances. The town of Amherst does not use the term ordinances in any of its bylaws or related documents. Okay, this is a resolution, not a bylaw, so I believe that's okay. Um, front row right here. Larry Kelly, Precinct 5. Mr. Moderator, I have a motion. All right. I move to dismiss. Motion has been made to dismiss Part A of well, Article 36. Both of them. But Do I hear a second? I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. So I have a friend who's an attorney over in Northampton for many, many, many years, not Mr. Newman. Um, and he was adamantly, adamantly uh, anti-death penalty. And me being the law and order kind of guy, I've always been. You can imagine where, where I come down on that one. So we used to have some pretty spirited discussions. And uh, he had a sea change 19 years ago. He changed his mind overnight. And that was in response to the Oklahoma City bombing. And specifically, it was in response to a, I think it was the only interview that Mr. McVeigh gave to the New York Times. And the quote, the reporter asked McVeigh, so what about all those kids? You know, what about all those kids that were in that daycare center? And he said in response, rather coldly, collateral damage. And my friend Paul said, you know, that man deserves to die. That man deserves to die. Mr. Kelly, you'll come around to the subject. I absolutely have. will. I absolutely will. <laughs> In fact, he said, I volunteer. I'll go to the prison and throw the switch myself. So the, the, the moral of the story is there are people out there that deserve to die. And there's something in there about targeted government killings. Well, what happened to Mr. McVeigh? What happened to him? The government killed him. We didn't, they didn't kill him with a drone. They killed him with, with a lethal injection. So, hang on a sec, excuse me, sir. I hear a point of order. Please wait for Mike, identify yourself. Jim Oldham, Precinct 5. Uh, I believe the motion to dismiss is to dismiss uh, Part A, which th it does not appear that he's speaking to Part A. Here's targeted government That's killings right there. Yes. Um, is there is a reference to targeted government killings in Part A. Okay. I stand corrected. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, as Mr. Turkell Mr. Kelly, said, you may continue. Okay. Thank you. As Mr. Turkell said, you know, the, the resolution says that the local police department will not violate your rights. Well, that's, they can't do that anyway. You know, that police officer back there, excuse me, he's a constable at the moment, but he has a deadly weapon strapped to his hip. Is anybody in this room afraid? that he's going to violate your civil rights, such as Kent State. Remember what they got the National Guardsmen on? They got them on a violation of civil rights. Well, that's the same difference. The Amherst Police Department is trained not to violate your civil rights. I just think the message that, that's being sent here is, is just 
horrendous. I just think it says to the Amherst Police Department, we don't trust you, you know, we don't trust you, so we're gonna tell you that you can't violate our civil rights or Fourth Amendment rights or whatever it is. Well, as Mr. Shirkel said, we can't, they can't do that now anyway. They can't do that now anyway. So, thank you. So the motion before us is now a motion to dismiss, which also takes a majority vote. If that motion passes, we will have dismissed Part A. If that motion fails, then the main motion under Part A will be back before us. Point of order. Um, I hear a point of order. Why don't you speak in the microphone? Yeah, my question would be, what's the difference between dismiss and vote no? Um, ah. In the case of a resolution, not all that much. It changes the vote. It changes the negative vote into a positive vote. Some people might have the opinion that it sends a different kind of message, but in truth, there's not really much difference between the two. There might be a better legal answer than that, but that's just my humble human answer to that. Um, yes, I see a hand way back in the corner there. And before you speak, um, I'm going to give a fair amount of leeway to the pros and cons of dismissal versus the, and the pros and cons of approving or disapproving of the article, because they are all pretty closely related. But the first thing we vote on will be the motion to dismiss. You may proceed. But identify yourself, please. Isaac Benazra, Precinct Day. Uh, uh, I'm, I stand in opposition to the idea that we should dismiss what is to me an important issue of not only our civil rights, but our constitutional rights. And, and speaking against this motion to dismiss, I want to say that we already have, by everybody's admission, uh, every corner, every part of our messages on, on internet, we're already being watched. I don't know where they are here, but I know that the only ones I trust are ACTV. Uh, because, because they're going to use this information to give the, the community at some point when they go back on air an opportunity to understand why this is an important issue, why it needs to come before a town meeting. I don't, uh, you know, in this period, where we have this organization, governmental organization, that's now being scrutinized by the whole world, you know, our, our, our secret efforts to uh, put down on record somewhere, in some, some place, everything we have said or want to say in the future. Do we need more, more vehicles to, to spy on American citizens. That's what Part A is all about. If we want to get into a discussion about saving lives or killing co collateral, I still think the Constitution, everybody has a right to be presumed innocent until found guilty. And, and, and I'm going to vote for Part B, too, because I think, I think we've gone too far already. When every time we take away the rights of other people, we're taking away our own rights. So let's get serious. This is what it's all about. Do we want to have more government control over our lives? And there's a gentleman waiting at the back of this row very patiently. Um, you can speak from back there with the mic, or you can come up here, whichever you prefer. And are you a registered voter in Amherst? I am not. And your name is? My name is Timothy Stiles. Um, do we give this gentleman permission to speak? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say no. No. Moderator, here's the majority. Yes, you may proceed. Identify yourself first, please. Thank you, everyone. My name is Timothy Stiles. I am a Hampshire College student that designs what you would call drones. Um, I think of them as more of toys, honestly. Um, and this bill to me means that I will actually be able to fly on my own campus, my home institution, without fear of persecution from the FAA. If I fly my drone several inches off the air, I can be, in fact, violating FAA regular, regulatory airspace. And even though they don't have the authority to deny me that right to space, they can bring me to court, which they have done with other students 
flying drones on their own campuses. So I ask that you vote to not dismiss this bill, or not bill, this, what would we call this? It's an article. A article. motion, actually. A yes. motion. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Um, yes, all the way on the aisle there. Precinct 10. This, uh, I, I'm supporting Mr. Kelly's motion to dismiss. Always happy to join Mr. Kelly over the years. Uh, the, the endless boundaries of this discussion, the questionable accuracy of this discussion, leads me to think that it's just the sort of thing that dismissal is suited for, and somewhat contrary to the moderator's comment, uh, no does suggest the opposite of yes. Uh, dismiss suggests that this may not be the best forum to settle a thing, or that this may not be the best mode in which the discussion can be carried on. So I think that uh, dismissal is rather appropriate, and we all have, and the Supreme Court will have, I'll bet you dollars to pennies, this will be back someday for court discussion. Uh, I think it's a good time to dismiss this and not, not to resolve it, not to say good or bad, which uses, not which uses. Thank you. I'm ready to come to a vote. Doesn't look that way. Yes, way over there, next to the gentleman in the white shirt. Elaine Fraunhofer, Precinct 8. I am just rising to say I'm in opposing the motion to dismiss in favor of this uh, article. Um, I think it's well written. I think it serves the purposes um, that were discussed before. And I think a previous speaker said that it, he feared that it would send a message that we don't trust the police. And I think the entire Bill of Rights sends that message. I think we always have to rein in power when it's can be abused, and this is an appropriate use of that. Thank you. Um, yes, in the striped shirt back there in the center. Uh, Richard Morris, Precinct 7. You know, when I first heard that there was going to be a resolution about drones, I said, oh, great. Finally, I can support an aspect of Amherst foreign policy, that the US should not violate the state sovereignty of other countries using drones. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. So this is a resolution about law enforcement using drones. And um, I'd like to speak, um, I'm associating myself in, in agreement with Mr. Kelly's motion, but I think I'm more in the spirit of Mr. Mainzer. I'd like to speak on sort of a, sort of a no comma but point of view, which is that I do see a problem here that Mr. Newman and others are talking about, um, but I don't think the problem has resolved itself in a way that makes this resolution clear to me as to where the town should go. Um, I have a concern, a countervailing concern, and I think town government has gone too far in this regard, which is that there are parts of this town in certain parts of the day that are in a state of, of what I would call excessive liberty. That is, that there isn't a police officer for miles around. If there is a call to a domestic violence incident, I think there are occasions when there's only one cruiser left for the whole town on various parts of the day. So I suppose if Amherst wants to do law enforcement inexpensively, as it continues to want to do, where it is grossly understaffed in my opinion, there may be occasions when uh, uh, drones may be necessary or maybe a cheaper way to do the law enforcement task that is so badly needed in this town. So. I'm taking, I guess I would take a sort of a wait and see approach. I'm gonna vote yes on Mr. Mo uh, Kelly's motion, but I do see a problem with personal privacy. I do see a problem with the use of drones, but I don't see how this is r resolving out yet in terms of the pluses versus the minuses. So I will be voting yes with Mr. Mainzer and Mr. Kelly. Um, Mr. Yaddy. I think that with the new technology, um, Identify yourself. Oh, I'm Frank Eddy, Precinct 8. 
Um, I think with the new technologies of drones, uh, what the parameters are going to be is being discussed. In fact, the state legislature is working on this as well. Um, I think that by passing a resolution from this town, from Northampton, from Leverett, the idea is that we're speaking to our concerns and we're registering our concerns as this is being worked out and negotiated. And so I think that it's on the one hand, a symbolic vote. This is not an ordinance. Uh, in fact, it probably is premature for an ordinance waiting for the state to take a stance. But I think it's a statement from us of our concern, and therefore I think that we should um, defeat uh, Mr. Kelly's uh, proposal and actually pass this resolution. Um, yes, gentlemen in the back of the aisle there. You are not a registered voter. Okay. All those in favor of allowing Mr. Napolitano to speak, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say no. No. Um, the ayes have it. You may proceed. I want to first apologize for the distracting hellion running around. It is way past her bedtime, and she wanted to go to mini golf, and I took her to town meeting. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to talk, and I, I hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about um, the second part of this, the part B of this article, but I just wanted to say that the, the point of this article, of this, this of section A, uh, is that the FAA is making rules about drones. Drones are coming. It's a technology. Uh, it can be good, used for good. It can be used for bad. Um, but it's coming. And at the moment, the only entities that really have uh, the uh, the ear of, of Congress are the is the AUVSI, which is the lobbying group of Raytheon, um, L3, uh, Lockheed Martin, and other large uh, organiz uh, large businesses, defense con military contractors that have run out of a market overseas. Um, the the U.S. is no longer uh, the intelligence agencies. The military is not buying up. Uh, nearly as many uh, uh, drones as they were a decade ago. They've got, they're, they're full up. And so what you see happening now is these huge companies are now looking for a market uh, and they're looking within the United States now because they can't sell them overseas. They're looking to create a market here. Uh, and so this is about having our voices, your voices being lifted and saying, we're not going to change a hundred year old rules that the Supreme Court has handed down because these large companies want a market to sell to the, in the United States. So this is very much a libertarian issue. Uh, if the, the rules that are being changed, as Dr. Voss said, are about your own property and whether you control your backyard or not. Uh, and so I urge you not to dismiss this and in fact to pass it at just for selfish reasons of maintaining control, sending a, a, a message that we want to retain control of our, our backyards. Thank you. Um, yes, I see a hand over there in the blue. Sharon Varitira, Precinct 2, I call the previous question. Most of the previous question has been made and seconded. We will now come to immediate vote. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will then come to a vote on the motion to dismiss. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. As opposed, please say no. no. Moderator, here's two-thirds. Okay, the motion before us is the motion to dismiss part A of Article 36, which you can see down at the bottom there. Majority vote required. All those in favor of the motion to dismiss, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. Motion to dismiss has failed. We now have the main motion before us, which also requires a majority vote. Is there further discussion, or are we ready to come to a vote? I see no hands. We, okay. Next time, try and raise it before I say that. But yes, front row. On Vest Precinct 9, Mr. Moderator, it just seems to me that this is a good uh, article to uh, vote in favor of at this point because it, uh, it is clear that the uh, military contractors have run out of their big, huge market, and it's, uh, you know, uh, so they're looking towards other markets, 
And it just seems to me that these countries where the drones have been flying for the last 10 years, Afghanistan, Yemen, you know, it just seems that these people, they would have liked to have had a say whether or not they, drones would have been able to fly in their backyards or not. So it just seems to me that this is, it doesn't, you know, uh, the final say doesn't need to, we don't need to dis, uh, decide anything uh, right now for the whole country, but just for now, we can just follow our neighbors, Northampton and Leverett, and just take a step back and have a little bit more control over where we're going with these drones. And as far as, as, far as toys go, you know, flying helicopters, airplanes, if you want to call them drones, drones, but just don't put weapons on them, don't put cameras on them, and just ma let your neighbors know that you're going to fly your toys and, you know, develop them as you will. Thank you. And I see no hands, so we're ready to come to a vote. We are voting on the motion under Part A of Article 36. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. We now move on to motion for part B of Article 36. And do you need the wording or do you have the wording that I sent you? If I can remember. <laughs> Why don't you come on over here? Same thing, read the top paragraph. I move that town meeting endorse part B of the motion under Article 36 as it appears on the screen. Thank you. I need that piece of paper back, though. <laughs> I did hear a second. You may now speak to your motion. To start with, um, the motion says that we will bring this resolution to our congressmen and our two uh, U.S. senators for them to proceed uh, with a recommendation and attempt at law uh, in the U.S. Congress to prevent the assassination uh, by drones. And this um, uh, Resolution was shown to Jim McGovern, who indeed endorsed it. So he is one of the people who received this resolution, and he is pleased to do this. And he has listed on a letter and email to me uh, on the back table uh, a number of things that he has already initiated along these lines. Um, I should also say that um, this is, like the other, is really a conservative um, uh, wish. This is to guarantee constitutional rights. Uh, it is concerned about the direction we're going because we're going in a direction that is not the way our founding fathers expected us to live. Targeted killings approved by our president is a great departure from the principles of the US, which was established with the recognition of the flaws of human nature. That is, the need to trust in government needs to be balanced with responsibility to that power. To preserve freedoms, we are a nation of law, of due process, of public trials, and accountability. The concept of perpetual war against terrorism and our enemies everywhere has led us to our becoming a frightened nation where surveillance and prevention violence, preventive violence, are honored as the way the only way we can be safe. The Constitution of the United States was more skeptical uh, of its understanding of human nature and is wary of the power being allowed in the actions of one person, be it king or president, or any small group of people. Thus, we believe in the concept of equality before the law, not that some people can judge and be the law. 
On September 30th, 2011, the United States killed two of its citizens, already mentioned from the, from the town meeting. Um, on October 14th, Doing it right. Can you move it a little bit to the second? Um, sorry. Um, so there already mentioned there was the killing of uh, Anwar Al Alawadi. Uh, which was a targeted killing. It was, it was actually decided uh, by, the, by purposeful. Uh, Samir Khan was actually not a targeted killing. He was sitting next to the person who was targeted and they both were killed. The important thing is they were both U.S. citizens and that uh, means that through presidential order, uh, two U.S. citizens were tried, uh, uh, found guilty and executed by one person or one person with some advisors. And shortly after that, within two weeks, the son of uh, Al Alawati was, was executed by drones. There was some controversy as to why he was executed since he was a 16-year-old boy. Finally, it was determined by our uh, uh, government that it was a mistake. He was not targeted, an Egyptian was targeted for assassination and he happened to be in the same vicinity, but it turned out it was wrong. Actually, the Egyptian who was targeted was not there, so it was a mistake. Um, so those are three American citizens who were uh, executed. Um, so this is beyond foreign affairs, this is now domestic. This has to do with constitutional guarantees. Um, besides the moral and ethical issues, uh, I wanted to mention three very practical reasons why this is a terrible policy. Uh, drone technology is prone to technical and human error, and completely innocent people, including children, their parents and grandparents, are being killed. Um, there are two, besides target assassinations, there's signature assassinations, signature killings. Signature means that someone's 7,000 miles away through marvelous technology is observing a scene of people going about their daily lives. When they look as if they're doing something against the best interests of the United States, they are seen as combatants and they're killed by drone strike. Um, this is really profiling. You'll need to finish up now. Okay. Um, so uh, I would mention fast that our reaction to 9-11 is an example of how people react when they feel that their neighbors and loved ones are killed uh, inappropriately. And so we are making dedicated enemies with this policy. Mr. Hayden for the select board. The uh, select board was unanimous in its notion that matters such as this are best debated amongst yourselves and make no recommendation. And Ms. Moran for the Finance Committee. We have no recommendation on this part. And this also requires a majority vote. And again, I have a few people who request in advance to speak. I'm going to call on one of them now, Mr. Ranka. And are you a registered voter in Amherst? Hi, good evening. Uh, Joseph Ronka, I'm from Precinct 6. Thanks. And um, I'm obvious, obviously in support of Article 36. Um, I think you should know that there are many credible and no noteworthy non-governmental organizations. Well, I think they're noteworthy. You be the judge. There's Pax Christi, Project Plowshares, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the International Association of schools of social work, which for what it's worth, I represent at the UN in Geneva, who have endorsed statements by the United Nations Special Rapporteurs on extrajudicial summary and arbitrary executions. These statements have asserted, among other things, one, the destabilizing potential of such a robotic arms race, given that now, believe it or not, 40 countries possess drone technology. Two, 
the failure of governments such as the United States of America to provide factual information about who has been targeted and with what outcome, including whether innocent civilians have been collaterally killed, murdered. Well, they said killed. I think it's murdered, whatever. Same difference. Three, such drone attacks have killed or maimed 4,000 people, primarily in Pakistan, many women and children. And four, that such weapons systems focus too narrowly on short-term military fixes for complex conflicts, giving thus tremendous fodder for politicians and policymakers to whip up hate and demonize opposing forces. I urge endorsement, therefore, of Part B of Article 36, a good and solid beginning, and a strong symbolic statement, and symbols, after all, move people, by the town of Amherst, which, you know, hangs the United Nations flag outside its government building, in support of the idea, also, that peace is a human right, so voting for this will mean peace is a human right, and it is a human right, let alone curb this drone madness. For we need to also be aware that on the horizon there are other developments. I go to the UN rather often, so. There is a thing known as lethal autonomous robotic systems, known as LARS. This is sophisticated weaponry, no longer with a human interface, but with onboard computers determining who should be killed. I have 20 seconds. They should have that clock there. How am I supposed to know this? Anyway, um, the article is somewhat limited um, because while it asks for the elimination of funds of this drone madness, um, and speaking of restitution, um, I'd like, it doesn't really get into concrete alternatives. It's a great article. Um, waging peace, after all, requires funds. Uh, they're minuscule um, compared to waging war. The United Nations budget, for example, Okay, so I vote for it. Um, it's a great article. And um, I was just gonna recommend supporting uh, United Nations Human Rights Conventions that are treaties. Thank you. Um, yes, back row there. If you're coming forward, you can leave your microphone with her, actually, because oh, okay. there's... I'll, I'll give it back to okay. you. Um. <laughs> ben Grosskup, Precinct 9. I want to support 36B in the best way I know how, which is using a melody by Stephen Sondheim and words, words by Charlie King. Isn't it strange? Aren't we a pair? One sitting safe on the ground, one in midair, send in the drones, never leave home, never ask why, one rolls the joystick around, one gets to fly. Which is the drone? Send in the drones. Hundreds are dead. Thousands are maimed. Digitized dolls on a screen. No faces, no names. Finish my four hour shift and I find I'm alone, far from the fray, address unknown. Don't give your name, feel no regret. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, fire and forget, only a drone. A deniable drone, no problem yet. Isn't it strange? Isn't it queer? Terror remotely controlled, a pilot's career. 
Where are the drones? Why are there drones? Is anyone there? No applause, please. Um, is there further discussion? Um, yes, the gentleman at the back of the aisle. I, I'm going to speak very briefly. I know everybody's been sitting here, and I have a child that's about to melt down. Um, there are two quick points that I just want to make. Um, one is that uh, this is much less complicated than the first article. Uh, this is basically goes to the sense of morality, and by that, the, the morality of the town. Um, Northampton has voted on this. Leverett has voted on this. Other cities and towns across the country have, have voted on a very, very similar resolution. Uh, so this is really um, about whether you approve of the president being able to just bomb places that we haven't de declared war on without congressional approval. Um, this is about, uh, somebody had mentioned Faisal Shahzad. Uh, he was the man in uh, 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 Times Square who had uh, tried to set up a bomb. The rationale, actually, that he used was because his friends had been killed by drones uh, back in Pakistan. Um, this, is, uh, this is more, I think, about why are we going to vote, or you, why are you going to vote uh, as a town on matters of foreign policy? Um, well, Frank mentioned that this isn't just about foreign policy. That this is also about our rights and the rights of citizens abroad. Um, but I would like to pose a somewhat radical proposition, and that is that what you say matters. Uh, your representative, uh, Representative McGovern, is supporting this, uh, is supporting this in Congress. And for a city and town to vote in favor of it strengthens his resolve and allows him to continue doing that, that business. If the town of Amherst, God of all places, Amherst, rejects this, um, then justifiably, I expect that the representative's spine might soft in just a little bit. Um, so I would vote that, uh, I would urge rather that folks vote for this um, just as a moral issue and also to continue the, the, um, the lobbying, the work that's being done by our own representative in Congress. Thank you. Um, I see a hand back there in the last row. Yes. My name is Millie Callahan. I come precinct seven. I've lived in this town since I was a year and a half old. And tonight, for the first time, I can tell you, this is why people think Amherst is really strange. <laughs> now, there are maybe 225 people here sitting and discussing this and saying this is what the town of Amherst means or says. Our population is about 35,000, and I don't think 200 votes in this body reflects the town of Amherst necessarily, and I think that should be remembered. Um, yes, second row in the center there. Uh, I'm going to vote Gary Tartikoff, Precinct 9. I'm going to vote in favor of the motion. Uh, when we make a motion like this, one of the things we're doing is we're talking to each other. Uh, that Lars, the gentleman spoke of earlier about those drones that can fire based on purely on computers and nobody has to be sitting in the screen. A lot of that was designed in Amherst. People in our art department with Defense Department grants did a lot of the designing of how you tell a tree from a certain distance or how you read a face. Facial recognition, but they did it specifically for the Department of Defense. And I think this would tell them that a lot of their fellow citizens are concerned. I think that's valuable. Ready to come to a vote. Um, looking for a new hand. Don't see a new hand. With an old hand. Blue hat in the back there. Motion for the previous question has been made and second. We will now come to a vote. If two thirds of you vote yes, we will vote on the article before us. 
All those in favor of the motion to the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. We will now come to a vote on part B of article 36, which is before you on the screen, or will be in just a second. There you go. And this requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the motion under article 36B, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's a majority. The ayes have it. We've already dealt with Article 37. So we move on to 38. Is Mr. O'Connor in the no. House tonight? Because he's the petitioner. Is there anybody else who's prepared to make the motion under Article 38? That's a bit, um, Ms. Brewer. So the select board will do it. Yes. The petitioner's not here. That's the plan. Would you are recognized. You may speak. Would, I'm, the reason I'm a little confused beyond the fact that we have a 60-page script that tells us exactly what to do when is the motion that is printed in the script. I wasn't clear if that was the final motion that had been provided by the petitioner. Um, Are we going to assume that's it? <laughs> we can assume that's it. You can choose to make the motion. You could choose to move this to June 2nd at 7.15. Those are your two choices. Or you can choose, um, yeah, those are your two choices, really. I, I'm in um, I didn't, and just to make it clear to town meeting, um, I did not hear from the petitioner, and it was fairly clear that we were going to get to this tonight. So um, those are your choices, Ms. Brewer. I move in terms of the article. Second. Motion has been made in terms of the article and seconded. Um, is there anybody who's interested in speaking in terms of this article? Or Ms. Brewer, would you like to take a shot at it? Well, Ms. If, you, Brewer. If, you look, if you look at the select board position, you'll see that we did not recommend this article. This, this article was not recommended by the select board. We actually never heard from the petitioner either. We have no additional information, no handouts, nothing. So we do not recommend this article. Um, and point of order, sir. I hear a point of order. Identify yourself, please. Pat Church, Precinct 5. Um, I think that if anyone was asked to speak to a motion, they should be speaking about what it says, um, not just we don't like it. Um, and I would, I, I feel as though what you offered earlier is a much more appropriate motion, which is to let the <laughs> petitioner come at a ne the next time that they can, you know, make sure he's here. If, if somebody from the body chooses to make that motion, they can do so. Um, and again, as I said, um, I didn't hear from the petitioner. Nobody heard from the petitioner about whether or not he would be here or why he wouldn't be here tonight. Um, I'm going to call on the boards first, and then I will call on somebody from the bodies. I hear a point of order. Claire Bertram, Precinct 8. Was this seconded? I didn't hear it. Um, yes. <laughs> but thank you. Um, Mr. Slaughter for the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee voted 5 to 0 with one member absent to not, re not recommend this article to you. Uh, just to sum it up, uh, if you haven't read the article specifically as it's in your, in your warrant, uh, the idea is that two properties on Dickinson Street, the uh, one is the site of the former classic and previously that Pages Chevrolet dealership and the lot adjacent to it that is a, uh, a parking lot, uh, both now owned by the trustees of Amherst College. Uh, the article uh, suggests that we as a town purchase that from those, uh, from, from Amherst College and then to then subsequently sell it to a uh, uh, a person or persons or business that would uh, fall within a certain set of classes that are spelled out in the article. Um, the Finance Committee in our second report to town meeting, or part two of our report to town meeting, uh, identify the reasons we're not in favor of this. Primarily, uh, it's unlikely that it's a willing seller, which makes the eminent domain much more complex and difficult and typically expensive. Um, 
there are some other complications with regard to the property and, and rights of way to people that own a, uh, other lots of land that are that are near and adjacent to those two properties, which may complicate the resale of the property. <clears throat> and we don't have a current buyer for the property if we took it from the people who currently own it. So for those reasons, the, uh, the Finance Committee voted against recommending this to you. And this... Um article would require a two-thirds vote because of the presence of eminent domain and authorization of purchase of land. Um, yes, third row right there in the white shirt. Steve Schreiber, Precinct 9, I call the question. I'm not going to accept that because we haven't heard from anybody else yet and I don't like to accept a previous question when the, no other voices have been heard and other hands were raised. Okay. Um, back there, second row from the back with your hand up there. Paige Wilder, Precinct 10. I have two questions. Do we have a figure for the amount of Amherst property that Amherst College owns? And what is the figure for the property taxes that were taken off the rolls when these were purchased? Anybody have those figures? Mr. Pooler. I don't know, is this on? Hello? Yes. Um, I don't know the answer to the first part of your question, um, except to say that Amherst College is the largest real estate property taxpayer in the town, and they pay approximately $480,000 in taxes per year. I don't know what their total um, acreage is. Um, they uh, are now paying uh, 11496 thousand dollars on this property um, it is still on the tax rolls uh, since it hasn't been converted to an educational use so until it has been it will still be taxed Ms. Moran also the uh, property one of the prop pieces of property has been um, valued by the town at five hundred forty eight thousand two hundred dollars and the other one at a hundred and thirty thousand dollars Yes, all the way in the back corner there. Yes, right there in the corner. Uh, Kenton Thaw, Precinct 1. I move that we postpone this to the next town meeting. <sighs> um, it's a little more complicated than that. You need to be more specific. <laughs> I would move that we postpone this until uh, 7.05 on Wednesday, the whatever that date is, 21st. Okay, I will accept that motion. Um, with the understanding, everyone has to understand, if we finish everything else tonight, we would, you are voting to come back on that night just for this article. Just want to point that out. Um, so, I speak to this? Um, yes, you may speak to your motion. Okay. Uh, first of all, I just think it's not, I have no idea why Vince isn't here, but I know he's put some effort into it. Well, maybe somebody can speak to why he's here, and then you can make that, I hope you recognize her and she can uh, you know, speak to that. Also, of the, all the articles we have left, we only have one more article that's not sponsored by him. So it does seem to me that, you know, we should just have another meeting and take up all of his articles. Or we could just uh, adjourn and let, you know, Mr. Weiss come up with his article at that same town meeting. You know, I think that might be a good thing and get out of here a little early one night. Uh, <laughs> So I would like to suggest that all the articles uh, that are left, you know, maybe be, uh, and maybe I should have just made a motion to adjourn until then, um, but that's yeah, we, not yeah. debatable. So, um, so I'm just saying let's adjourn tonight if we can. Mr. Weiss wants to present his, let's do it. But unless there's a good reason why we could continue without Mr. O'Connor, you know, he's a very respected, hardworking member of town meeting. I just think we should not, uh, you know, continue without his input. Thank you. Okay. Just make it clear, the motion made is the motion to postpone consideration of Article 38 until Wednesday the 21st. And I did hear a second, and he spoke to that motion. Um, yes, green shirt right there in the aisle. Uh, Tim Neal, Precinct 4. 
Uh, I sympathize with uh, Mr. Connor not being here. However, I uh, am very concerned about the precedent we're setting. Uh, we all make every effort to come. I think you could name any other person who maybe not doesn't show, and I think there's a, a real dangerous precedent in just adjourning because a petitioner isn't here for the article, and I just have some real concern about that. Again, just to clarify, the motion isn't to adjourn, it's to postpone, but um, I think the point was taken regardless. Um, yes, right there, um, third row from the back. Thank you. Adrian Terzi, Precinct 7. May I point out that there are a number of other articles uh, by the petitioner uh, O'Connor. And what does that do to the question of it's not just Article 38, but we have uh, articles uh, uh, except for Mr. Weiss's 39, we have 40, 41, and I believe 42 as well. Um, we will deal with them one at a time when we get to them. Um, yes, over there, third row from the back. Bonnie McCracken, Precinct 6, and it's my fault that Vince is not here this evening because at 4.30 this afternoon, I told him I could not drive a child to Springfield to a basketball game. We all have to understand that Vince does not have internet. He does not use the computer. He cannot communicate as quickly as the rest of us, and it was difficult for him to make a phone call. So, I'm sorry, it's my fault. I wasn't generous enough with my time to drive this child to Springfield to a basketball game. So, I would appreciate the consideration to, to Mr. O'Connor that we move this. I'll recognize your point of order when she's done speaking, okay? That we move this article to 521. I will recognize your point of order when she is done speaking. Let me continue. And, you know, his, he is always here, and he needs this one time where he's gone with, and very generous with his time for this child. So that I think out of consideration for the time that he gives to the town and to children of this community that we move to hear this on 521 at 7.05 p.m. Thank you. Okay, and you have a point of order. Okay, um, she was speaking about the pros or cons of dealing with it tonight or moving it, so I think it was a legitimate thing to be talking about. Um, yes, in the back row there. Catherine Gilbert Espada, Precinct 6. Um, is it possible to change this motion so it's June 2nd? No, it is not. A motion has been made and seconded, and we have to deal with a motion that's on the floor. Um, Miss, I hear a point of order. Um, wait for a mic microphone. Um, Hilda Greenbaum, Precinct 1, I was going to offer a substitute motion. Would that be in order? No, it would not. I want to deal with this motion first, and if this fails, we have the choice to do something else. Okay, thank you. Ms. Brewer. I'd like to point out two things. One is that the special town meeting that is scheduled for June 2nd, which clearly some people are thinking might be a better date for this. First of all, we have no reason to believe Mr. O'Connor will or will not be present that night. Secondly, on June 2nd, we don't know that. On June 2nd, we have seven articles to deal with. I very much hope he'll be here because two of them are his. But we have seven articles to deal with already that night. So shifting all these articles to that night per does not appear to be appropriate. Also, I will point out that Article 38, as opposed to the other articles by this petitioner that would be before us tonight, Article 38 requires a two-thirds majority to pass. It refers to eminent domain. It seems highly unlikely this article can pass this town meeting. Therefore, this article, at least, seems as though we could dispose of it. Um, yes, second row in the aisle right here. Wait for the microphone, please. Faith Turner, Precinct 6, we have every reason to believe that Vince would be here because he's always here. Um, let's see. Yes, right here, fourth row. Motion of the previous question is made and seconded. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will come to a vote on whether to postpone consideration of Article 38 until Wednesday night. 
All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. no. Motion for previous question has passed. Hang on just a second. We will now come to a vote on the motion to postpone consideration of Article 38 till 7.05 on May 21st, which is the day after tomorrow, Wednesday. Majority vote. I hear a point of order. John Fox, Precinct 10. If there isn't a quorum on May 21st, what happens then to this motion if it were, if, if, if it were passed? Okay, if there's no quorum on any night, the only valid motions that can be made are a motion to recess, to tell everybody to go call their friends and get here, or a motion to adjourn to a different date certain. So if there's no quorum, then we just would adjourn to a different night. And just a reminder to everybody, the way town meeting works, until we deal with all articles and dissolve the town meeting, nothing has legally happened yet. All the money we've spent on all the budgets and things, nothing, nothing is complete until it is all complete. So um, personally speaking as moderator, I would expect everybody to rise to their sense of duty and appear whenever a town meeting is called. Is there, um, let's see, we just passed the motion of the previous question, so we are now coming to a vote on whether or not to move this to Wednesday night. That's correct, we haven't had that vote yet, we're gonna have it now, it's a majority vote. All those in favor of moving consideration of Article 38 until Wednesday night at 7.05, please say aye. Opposed, please say no. No. We need a counting vote. Moderator is in doubt. Do we have our six tellers here tonight? I see one, two, three, four, five, six. I hear a point of order away from microphone. Can we get a microphone up here? Microphone? Devin, Precinct 7. Uh, Mr. Moderator, does that require a two-thirds vote or a majority vote? Oh, just a majority vote. Clearly there was a majority. There was not a clear majority to me, sorry. Um, sure, I'll listen once more. All those in favor of considering Article 38 on Wednesday night, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. Moderator is still in doubt. All those in favor of considering Article 38 on Wednesday, please rise and remain standing. On the right, there are 23 yes votes. You may be seated on the right. On the left, there are 33 yes votes. You may be seated on the left.
I'm sorry? In the center, there are 34 yes votes. You may be seated in the center. All those opposed to the motion to move to 521, please rise and remain standing. On the right, there are 30 no votes. You may be seated on the right. On the left, there are 15 no votes. You may be seated on the left. In the center, there are 17 no votes. You may be seated in the center. The total is 90 yes votes and 62 no votes. So Article 38 will be heard at 7.05 on the 21st. We now move on to Article 39. I call on Mr. Weiss to make a motion. Is there a point of order? Um, I don't hear a point of order. I'm calling on Mr. Weiss to make a motion. I hear a point of order. Wait for a microphone, please. Where's our other microphone person? She's right there looking for a microphone. <laughs> Try and pay attention. Yes, I hear a point of order. Page, page Wilder, Precinct 10. Um, I think that the last count illustrates that there's a real problem hearing in this room, an accurate hearing of what's actually said when it's two-thirds yes and one-third no and there's a doubt. I wonder if we could consider the structure of how we have our, um, how people are seated, uh, where the moderator's podium is, that kind of thing um, in the future. This, this isn't really a point of order that I want to take up now. I want to point out it was not a two-thirds vote. And sometimes voices sound different than other times. If you think there's a problem, you can take it up with me by email or discussion or something like that. But it's not something to talk about here. Mr. Weiss. Uh, I, have a point of order. I hear another point of order. I wasn't sure. Says, My Ken thought precinct one. I wasn't sure. Um, I know often we adjourn when we're not in the middle of an article, because generally that somebody's uh, recognized before we've introduced another article. So I thought if I had my hand up that I was able to make a motion to adjourn. Is that not correct? It would be correct if I recognized you, but I recognized Mr. Weiss instead, who was over uh, there waiting to be recognized as well. You, you ignored me because I had my hand up, but you, but you didn't hear a point of order. So you did see me. It's you had your hand up there. Mr. Weiss was standing there, also looking very eager to speak, and I chose him. I'm sorry, it's, okay. that's your point of order, but that's my response. Mr. Weiss, you may speak to your motion. Oh, dear. I move that it be the sense of this town meeting 
that the Amherst Town Manager and Select Board continue to try to find a way to acquire by any legal and financially feasible means the property known as Echo Village, identified as Block 2, Parcel 21 of Map 18A of the Town Cadaster. And further, that upon that acquisition, that property will be designated as affordable housing in perpetuity and conveyed to a nonprofit affordable housing management organization in accordance with the applicable provisions of the Massachusetts general laws. I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. Thank you for the second. Tonight's presentation is not about the invasion of the body snatchers, but the invasion of the home snatchers. A couple of years ago, Eagle Crest Realty Company, owned by a local family, the Cherwadis, bought Echo Village from Jerry Gates. Echo Village is comprised of 24 units, and 13 of those units rented at the time of purchase had housing sub subsidies. 17 of the units were rented by families with children. Upon completing that purchase, Eagle Crest raised the rents and began eviction proceedings. All but two families have left. Eight of the families ended up leaving Amherst because of the lack of affordable options for them. The on-site playground that children used daily was dismantled while ch young children were still living there. Building maintenance and grounds upkeep all but ceased, and winter clearing was barely existent. This got better for a short time after the Gazette reported this story and most recently in preparation for the new student summer rentals. A few of the remaining families were served with eviction notices, but with one exception, the evictions were averted and actually tossed out of court. Um, that one eviction actually could have been prevented, but it was a little too late for the family to have found that out. These, the families were in large part harassed and um, intimidated by ownership and ended up, as I have just said, leaving. We've been hearing many reports in this town meeting, including tonight, of uh, declining young family and children numbers in our town, much of it due to the high cost of ownership and rentals. The high cost of rentals is directly tied to the tremendous profits property owners can make renting to students who can divide the rents, something a family can't do, unless you consider that the children could pay part of the rent. A year ago, petitioners brought a similar article to the article that was up there a minute ago. Um, that article was referred back to the Housing and Sheltering Committee who had supported it. But in doing so, town meeting passed on the chance to take a position on what we thought of that purchase of Echo Village and whether or not we wanted the town to try to acquire that property. And while the language of a pro uh, purchase of property is always the same, acquired by purchase, gift, and or eminent domain, it appeared that many town meeting members were frightened by the prospect of a taking, even though passing the article last year would have only given authorization, not a command to do so. Fortunately, the select board and town manager promised to find a way to purchase the Echo Village property anyway, and they made very good on that promise to try. But sadly, after months of hard work on the part of our town officials, the Cherawadis rejected the offer from a buyer who would have returned the units to affordability. That purchase was to be done jointly with Rolling Green Apartments, also slated to become fully market rate rentals after many years of 20% of the units being affordable. And we will be discussing that portion of the possible purchase when we take up Article 20, Part C on June 2nd. After discussing the situation, with town officials, my article, I concluded that leaving the Article 39 as written would suffer a similar fate, or even worse, as last year's article um, about this property. So you see before you a motion you'll be voting on tonight. A yes vote, again, will not require the town to take by eminent domain the Echo Village property. It will not require the town to do anything. It will do two things in my mind. If passed, this would be a more formal way for town meeting to tell our town manager and select board that we approve of their efforts and tell them if there is a financially feasible way to acquire the property, we want them to know that they, they have our blessing. A yes vote will also be a way for this town meeting, and remember the language of the motion is clear, the sense of this town meeting, to tell our entire community that we do not take lightly the dissolution of 24 affordable units for profit. We do not take lightly when that dissolution forces families to leave their homes, to take children out of their schools, and to leave town. 
and that we believe someone or someones can make a, a very reasonable profit without harming so many people. And we do not expect to solve our student housing problem on the backs of low and moderate income families. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, could we get the motion on the screen? Was that your point of order? Good. It's mine too. Yes, there we go. There Elisa we go. Rubenstein, Precinct 10. I just wanted to say as he was speaking, we weren't really seeing what he was talking about. We were seeing the thing he, that we were not going to vote on, but maybe people were confused. Right. So just to clarify, what we're voting on is the motion before you, which is a motion in the, to the sense of town meeting and not to the article, which is an acquisition by eminent domain. Make sense? And this requires a majority vote, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I'd like to call on Ms. Brewer for the select board. Since we have a little time here, I'm going to read what it says on the April 28th report of the select board. On April 22nd, the select board voted unanimously to recommend this article. This might surprise some of you who were here last year when we were talking about the article Mr. Weiss just referred to, which did include eminent domain and there was a split vote on the select board and it didn't pass in town meeting, it was referred. What we voted unanimously to recommend is the motion as you saw eventually up there on the screen. The heavily revised motion recommended by the select board reflects both the strongly held values of our community while acknowledging the challenge of working with a reluctant seller. Despite lack of 2013 town meeting support for wording in the original warrant article, so even though town meeting didn't give support to eminent domain and other purchase. Our town manager and other staff have spent many, many dedicated hours facilitating conversations with the current owner and potential affordable housing buyers. And this new motion simply encourages that to continue. So we say yes. And Ms. Moran for the Finance Committee. Um, the Finance Committee uh, has no recommendation on this motion. This motion you will see is printed in the Finance Committee's report to town meeting for Article 39. Thank you. So as I said, this will require just a majority vote because it's just a sense of town meeting. And I believe I originally had a request from Aaron Blodgett, but I believe he's not here. And Andrea Battle request to speak. Do I have that right? Yes. Hello. I'm Andrea Battle, one of the seven members of the Amherst Housing and Sheltering Committee. One year ago, the Housing and Sheltering Committee proposed a similar article that was referred back to, to us by town meeting. At the same meeting, the town manager and most of the select board asserted that they would immediately begin efforts to acquire Echo Village. The Housing Sheltering Committee, in a follow-up memo, asked that they do so and keep us informed of their progress. As we know now, the town manager and his staff did follow up, attempting to bring the owners of Echo Village together with the organization that offered to buy the property. The town manager and his staff also worked to assure financing for the purchase. Unfortunately, the deal fell through at the last moment. The town manager and his staff are to be commended for this effort. The question before us is what happens next? I don't think we should give up. We think housing, affordable housing in Amherst and arguing for the purchase of Echo Village through a non-profit developer is an unusual opportunity. Although the Housing and Sheltering Committee originally chose not to take a position on this article based on the new language proposed by Jerry Weiss, I and the Housing and Sheltering Committee unanimously recommend the town meeting let the town manager, his staff, and the select board know that we support their past efforts and that we urge their continuation. If we pass this article, we are giving the town manager and his staff our support to continue to pursue this opportunity while also giving them more flexibility to negotiate. Thank you. Is there further discussion before we come to a vote? I see a hand over there, second row. Uh, James Smith, Precinct 6. Uh, this is a flawed motion in that it has a sense of this town meeting uh, to try to do something. Uh, and yet it has an action part to it. It's a flawed art, flawed motion. I'm sorry, a flawed, did you a say? F-L-A-W-E-D. 
Um, I think the, the sense of town meeting applies to the whole paragraph. That's my interpretation. I don't know if you would like to speak to that, Mr. Weiss, as well. You're welcome to. Yeah. It's the sense of town meeting, the entire paragraph. Yes. The sense of town meeting. Which I think removes the flaw. Um, I see one hand right here, fourth row. Gordon Freed, Precinct 6. Is the building in perpetuity or is the property in perpetuity? Mr. Weiss, want to try and answer that? That sounds like a legal question. I don't think I can answer it. This is kind of boilerplate language. Um, as far as I know, this is best practice language. Uh, sorry. Yeah. And I just also want to point out, we're not passing a bylaw here. It's just a sense of town meeting. So I think it's OK. Is there further discussion before we come to a vote? I see a hand there and a hand there. So start with the Finance Committee. Uh, Microphone right in front of you. Uh, I'm not speaking for the Finance Committee. I've actually seen this uh, uh, language before. But I just had a question following uh, a comment earlier on, uh, which is, are the first part and the second part, do they seem a little different to me? Uh, the first part is sense of the town meeting. And the second part is what, what, the, uh, what needs to be done with the property once uh, it has been acquired. Um, I think what the petitioner said, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's an implied, in that second line, after the and further, there's an implied in the sense of town meeting as well for the second paragraph. And that's what the petitioner said, and it's his interpretation. So I think that should answer your question. That sound good, Mr. Weiss? Great. Further discussion? Yes, over there. Bonnie McCracken, Precinct 6, and to speak to what the previous speaker said, as far as perpetuity, the restriction has to be on the land because the building is only a fixture. So to preserve it forever, I'm not giving a legal opinion, but from my background in uh, examining title, titles, real estate titles, pro houses, buildings are only fixtures and we have to preserve the property. The restriction has to be on the property. Further discussion? Looks like we're ready to come to a vote. This will require a majority. All those in favor of the motion before you, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. Aye. The ayes have it, passes. So hang on a second, I need to say something. And what I'd like to say is it's only 9.53, but I would gladly entertain a motion from the body to adjourn, and that's because we're already committed to coming back Wednesday, and the next articles are all by the same petitioner who's the Wednesday's article. Having said that, yes, do you have a motion to make back there? I, uh, um, use the microphone and identify yourself. I uh, can't our precinct one. I move that we adjourn until um, May 21st at 7 yeah. p.m. Motion has been I made and second to adjourn. It is not debatable. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no.